welcome to everybody and joining us for Inspiring Generosity in and towards your church plant. I'm the host today, Ben McKeck, and before I get back to you, Al and Paul, who are the real stars of the show, I wanted to kick off by first setting the scene a little bit about what you guys will be discussing today in this webinar. We should kick off with how generous are Australians really? Now, according to the World Giving Index, which you can see on your screens right now, Australia ranks sixth in the world according to the index, which measures whether people have volunteered in the past months, whether they've donated to charity, whether they've helped a stranger. But four in five people in Australia do give financially, which is a pretty great sum, right? And when it comes to health and disaster relief in Australia, Australians usually come to the fore at a time like that. Natural disasters seem to bring out the best in Australians when it comes to giving. So that's a little bit of background about Australians when it comes to generosity, but how is that going to apply in and towards our church plant? Well, we're going to find out very, very soon with our special guest, Paul Harrington, and our presenter, Al Stewart. Before I get to you guys, Al and Paul, just be patient. I want to do a quick thank you to our excellent sponsors. Firstly, EA Insurance. If you haven't sorted out the insurance side of your church plant, you need to have a chat with EA Insurance. So go to ea.org. .au. And also I want to thank our sponsor, Compassion. Compassion releases children from poverty in Jesus' name. What a wonderful thing. Compassion is Christ-centered, child-focused, and church-based. If you want to be part of releasing children from poverty in Jesus' name, go to Compassion.org. Now we're almost there, Al and Paul. Almost at you guys. I'm going to turn myself off very soon. But two quick things for everybody else who's joining us today. If you want to see uh, Paul and Al's heads even bigger on your screens, and I'm sure you do, you want them to fill your screen, feel free to adjust the size of the view panel that you've got. Uh, click in the bottom right-hand corner and drag out the size of the video. And also, as Paul and Al go through their discussion, you might have a question about something Paul's got to say or Al's got to say. Send them through to me. I'm your host, Ben. Don't send them to Al. He's got plenty of other stuff to do all through today. I'll be getting the questions and sending them through, and there'll be a time of questions straight after Paul and Al's initial interview. Okay, without any further ado, I'm going to hand across to director and founder of Geneva Push, Al Stewart, who is going to be speaking with our very special guest today, Paul Harrington, Minister at Holy Trinity Network. Over to you guys. Thanks, Ben. Uh, nice intro, mate. Uh, well, good morning to everyone involved in the webinar, and a special good morning to my good friend, Paul Harrington. Uh, G'day, mate. How are you? All right. All right. Now, mate, not everyone will know you. Uh, a couple of quick questions, maybe. Uh, you're um, Senior Minister of Holy Trinity, Adelaide. Uh, did you grow up in Adelaide? Were you an Adelaide boy? I, I lived in the uh, the Shire of Sydney till I was 12. Then my family moved to Adelaide. So high school, university, uh, young graduate working life, all, all in Adelaide. I then spent four years in Sydney at a Bible college, then back in Adelaide, where, I, where I've been at Trinity ever since. Okay. Um, Adelaide's the city of churches. Did you grow up going to church in Adelaide, like in your teenage years? Yeah, I I grew up in a Roman Catholic family, so I went to a uh, yeah went to a local Catholic church. By the time I got to my teenage years, I was an atheist or agnostic. I wasn't sure which. Didn't really care. And it wasn't until I went to university that I I got that sorted out. Okay, well, you did get it sort of. Can you tell us a couple of sentences? How did, how did that happen? How did you go from the, the agnostic atheist uh, law student yep. uh, to being a, you know, an evangelical Christian? Yeah, a friend of mine in the law school, I sat down with him, read the Bible, and uh, over a period of months, I went from thinking Jesus was just a, a myth to thinking he was real, and then a, a, I had a conviction of of sin, the fact that I just rejected God, just run things my own way, uh, and that led me to becoming becoming a Christian. I mean, there's, there's a fair bit more going on in the background apart from that, but that's essentially what happened towards the end of the degree. Okay. It's always a dangerous thing to sit down and actually read the Bible. Uh, yep. Uh, yeah, we're in favour of that here at Geneva. Uh, okay. Now, mate, today uh, we're talking about the idea of uh, generosity and how do you lead and teach and encourage people to be generous in supporting gospel work. 
Uh, you're now a senior minister across uh, how many churches in the Trinity network? I keep losing count. Yeah, sure. We're, we've got eight churches, that is eight different locations, 14 congregations. So that's, okay. that's roughly the shape of it right now. Mm. Right. Now that's, that's church planting from one initial church site over how many years? So 15 years, we've got uh, a church site right in the CBD of Adelaide, uh, the, the oldest sort of church building in Adelaide. And then in the, the 90s, it, it was full. So we started thinking, do we build a bigger building? Do we start planting? And it, we just thought for the sake of the gospel, that is the more effective way to go was to send people out, start new churches. So what we did was we, we drew this notional driving ring around our church, which was a, a 20 minute dr driving ring. And we decided to try and plant churches on that boundary. Uh, so we wanted to push people as far away from the centre as we could because we figured in due course they might be able to plant further out from the city than that 20 minute ring. So uh, it meant it was a bit slower because uh, we, were, we were pushing towards the, the edge of what we could effectively do. Uh, but we figured that strategically for the second generation planting that would be a better way to go. Okay, by the way, the slide that's up, that red circle is where the original, the, the home base for Trinity is, not the, yep. 20, minute, um, not the 20 minute circle. In Sydney, that might yep. be a 20 minute circle, given that traffic. <laughs> so, mate, have you yep. managed to have uh, granddaughter churches? Have you got yep. churches sort of planted? Yeah, we have. So, when we, when we plant each church, what we've done is, uh, even at the public opening service, we've said to people, it's great we've planted this church and we pray that this church will be able to plant other churches. Uh, so that's, that's set into the core team DNA. That's our great desire because we want to see the gospel go to every part of Adelaide and South Australia. And that, that means we need to replicate that sort of mindset of evangelism and planting. So the first church we planted in 2001, uh, planted again in 2010. Uh, they sent out a daughter church. That, that granddaughter church from the city then planted again in 2015. So we've actually got a great great granddaughter plant, uh, which is great. And then this year in March, uh, one of our daughter plants that was planted in 2010, uh, planted in, in March this year. Uh, so that, that was terrific. And what we're trying to do is to take on church planting residents uh, into each, each of the churches that we've, we've got uh, with the idea that they get onto those teams, they learn about planting in our network, and then they take a group of people from that church somewhere else. Uh, so we've, you know, we've set up some funding models to try and you know, give, you know, prime the pump so that people can employ those, those church planting residents. Okay. All right. Very good. Now, part of what we're talking about today is the idea of um, well, most of, uh, generosity and asking people to support gospel ministry. Yep. How have you how have you gone about, or how do you think theologically about teaching people about generosity? It's not just a matter of saying you got God's money in your pocket. What's the as you talk through with your pastors, with the leaders of your churches, what kind of theological understanding have you come to? How do you set about teaching people that? Yep. Um, this is something I think we're we're still working out. I think most people are. We keep reviewing it and thinking about it, but. It, it seems to me that what we want to start when it comes to anything uh, is with the grace of God. So God's initiative with us. Uh, the risk, I reckon, with finances is that we uh, we make it something of a, a work that people do rather than a response to the grace of God in their lives. And so I want to keep saying to people, God has been so gracious and merciful to us what, is, what sort of shape or fruit does that, that produce in our lives? Uh, so we're always preaching on essentially the gospel, God's, God's initiative and grace towards us as the platform. Now, from one point of view, that's, that's got nothing to do with money, uh, but it's got everything to do with money. That, that is, when you preach the gospel, it's, got, it, it's obviously got everything to do with everything, uh, but... That's, that's got to be the platform that you always start with, I reckon, so that people never get confused about where money fits in terms of our thinking. Uh, and I reckon that's the way the, the Bible generally 
does it with almost every topic, uh, including money. Uh, so when you you, know, you go to a place like um, you know two Corinthians eight and nine, uh, it talks about you know the, the mercy of the Lord in that sort of context. You know the grace of God in Christ as being the foundation for the generosity that operates in the lives of the believers that he's writing to. And and so that that's that's certainly where we start for sure. Okay. Uh, you mentioned two Corinthians eight and nine. Do you run a kind of a, a stewardship series or something in the you know, like the last quarter? Some um some senior pastors have set aside a series of weeks and then have a kind of a pledge dinner and so do you have a, a focal point about asking people to commit for the following year? Yeah. Normally what we affect what you teach on for those weeks, that sort of thing. Yeah, sure. The the month of October is normally a month where we'll be talking about uh, ministry plans for the following year. So we we have that uh, that month where we'll preach on things to do with what's at the core or the heart of our mission and the way that those those core theological ideas are taking shape in our plans for the following year to reach out to others and to grow disciples. So that's not necessarily a stewardship campaign in the sense of talking about money, uh, but it is a time of talking about ministry direction. And at that stage, we'll then normally roll out the budget or the the financial plans that are attached to those ministry plans. So we're always starting with the, the grace of God, the shape of our ministry plans, then the implications for our finances as a result of that. We generally don't get people to pledge unless it's something uh, out of the box. So in the coming 12 months, the city congregation, so it's a mother church, we've been recruiting a Mandarin church planter and we're also wanting to take on someone else to uh, be dedicated towards evangelism and training and disciples, discipling people in evangelism. So they're two full-time staff appointments in one year, which for that congregation, along with everything else that's going on, is you know a significant jump in the budget. It's probably 25% jump in the budget. Mm -hmm. So at that point, we thought we will be very specific in going to the congregation and saying, we think this is a good idea, but it can only happen if you think it's a good idea and if you're willing to get behind it with the dollars. And so we set up a two-year pledging campaign. Now, we've done that in the past um, in various churches in our network, and we tend to do it more in our uh, younger church plants than we do in the mother church. Uh, and what we found is that in our network, the the pledged amounts generally line up with what's given to about 90 or 95 percent. Uh, right. So, so it's, a, it's an accurate way of planning for the future. Yeah. Right. Uh, could I ask how self-contained are your congregations? So you've got 14 different congregations. Are you are you asking each of them to meet their own budgets, and if they don't, there's cutbacks, or do you operate across the board? Um, sort of a, a one big bucket. Yeah, we do a bit of both. Uh, so each each of our eight churches, some of those have multiple congregations. So each of those have their own ministry plans and budget for each year. Yep. Uh, there's a network commitment to supporting the wider growth of the gospel, uh, so that um, we will bail out churches that hit a wall for some reason, so all of us will pitch in. Uh, but we're, we're asking churches to be responsible in terms of pressing, pressing the, their work of ministry forward and owning the cost of that. But strategically, it, it doesn't always work that way. So we want all our churches to be committed to that, to an enterprise of planting beyond themselves. And if they're going to do that, uh, we don't want them being isolated in their thinking about how it works for them as well. So it's, there's an all-for-one, one one-for-all sort of approach while we're still asking each church to be responsible. So that, I'll give you an example. Uh, a couple of years ago, one of our church plants was struggling financially. So the leadership team in that particular church plant decided they'd have to cut 
staff wages for a period of time by about 20%. When they, we have a meeting of all the senior pastors of our churches where we, we pray and read the Bible and, uh, and talk about ministry together. When they heard that that, that had happened, they all said, no, no, it's not the way we work. We're a network. We all take 2% and not you take 20% uh, because we work together with that sort of goal in mind. So there's that sense of collegiality because we share a common desire to see the gospel go out, plant more churches, work together to achieve that, cooperate in that sort of, that enterprise of taking the gospel out. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's a great story. So you're kind of balancing, though, um, responsibility at, at a congregational level and then cooperation um, at an entire network level. It's kind of a, yep. and that's probably works on relational capital as much as financial capital. Absolutely, yeah. So both, both work together and I suspect that in the future we're going to have more and more of our churches cooperating together to plant churches. So as we plant more in the same sort of area, I imagine two, three churches may have people in a certain location. Yeah. They'll all give people, they'll all give money, they'll all give support to get those churches up and running. Uh, so there's that sort of culture we're trying to develop. Yeah, very good, very good. Um, the next question is about, uh, we want to run church meetings that are welcoming to um, outsiders, to people who, who aren't yet Christian, people investigating. Um, one of the things that people are critical of churches is that churches are always on about money and want your money. Or yep. I know myself, I've, I've visited some churches and then had someone hold a plate under my nose. And, uh, it's embarrassing when you weren't planning to give. How do you talk about money with, um, with visitors present? Do you have any particular kind of wisdom on that, any particular culture that you've developed? Yeah, look, I, there are lots of different thoughts on that one. One is that a lot of the work for finances can be done without being public at this, you know, in our churches. That is, we've got lots of means of communication apart from uh, the you know, Sunday meeting time. Yep. So use, making good use of uh, email in order to update people on what's going on, where the needs are, you know, how that's happening. Yep. How, however, you do want to be modelling in your Sunday meetings uh, how you think about this issue like you do on lots of different issues. And a number, number of those won't necessarily be culturally uh, welcomed by people who aren't converted. So, you know, the whole issue of sexual ethics right now is not necessarily the way our society is running uh, in terms of Christian thinking, biblical thinking. That doesn't mean we should avoid it. So we've got to be able to talk openly about different issues. From there, I think um, if you're talking publicly about money, you still talk about the grace of God that motivates it. So an unbeliever may not hear it, but when they hear you talking about the great kindness and mercy and grace of God towards us, uh, they're, get, they're getting evangelised as you do that, even when you're talking about money, because they're hearing that, that Christians aren't just feeling obliged or having their arms twisted behind their backs. They want to give for the work of the gospel because they've experienced it in a wonderful way. So that, that sort of culture operates. I think that uh, you want to make sure that the, the language is all around us, not you giving. Uh, I think it's too easy for pastors to talk to their congregations as if they're not one of the congregation. So uh, I've changed in my thinking about this. So years ago, I would never talk about what I did financially. And I think it's because I misunderstood what the Bible said on that question of being careful about being open uh, on this question of finances. These days, I won't talk about the dollars I give, but I might from time to time talk about the way I work out how much to give, or even talk about the percentage of income that I give. Uh, in order to help people understand that we're in this together, this is not me as a leader standing up and pointing my finger at the congregation and saying, you need to do better. Uh, so, I, you know, I, I talked about this maybe 12 months ago, and I said Sue and I, um, you know, are trying to work out how we can increase the percentage 
of what we give each year. Uh, so you know, we're up to somewhere in the 20, 20s you know, in terms of what we give of our income. And we're really keen to see if we can push into the 30s. Uh, now, I remember people afterwards were quite shocked because firstly they thought that we wouldn't be giving because we're staff. Uh, yeah, yeah. And then we're a bit taken aback by the percentage that I spoke about and asked how that could possibly be the case. You know, So it got, got me into a number of conversations that were quite useful because it, it helped me tackle people at a very practical level as well or discuss with them what's going on. Um, so those, those sort of issues, I mean, we're like a lot of churches. We make it clear when we're talking about finances if there are uh, people who aren't members there that they can take a bit of a nap at that point. Uh, and you know, tune out if they want to. Um, when we're preaching on it, I think modelling the whole question of why we give, the motivation, um, the fact that we're serious about finance in a world that, you know, a Western world like Australia, which is culturally idolatrous when it comes to money and stuff, uh, that can be quite challenging as well. So I, you know, I think you just do it openly and as friendly as you can. Yeah, it is interesting. When you speak on money, there's a there's a quietness or a stillness in the room or an intensity that's yeah. not there with many other topics. That's, yeah. uh, you know you're really you know you're really close to where people live. Uh, um, okay, so take yourself back uh, twenty odd years. Um, yeah. Or, or let's let's imagine you know that uh, you're an even younger man and uh, starting up a church plant. What, what kind of key principles would you want to put into into the, the, the DNA of a, of a new church plant as you're starting? What would you say, you know, the young guy says, um, you know, we haven't got enough money, we're struggling, whatever. As you build the first one, two, three, ten, twenty years of a church, what, what DNA would you put into the church about giving and um, uh, culture that way? Yeah, okay. I've, I've probably changed my thinking on this over the last 20 years uh, in that I think that often when I'm talking to church planters, they realise the desperate need for money, um, you know, to get, to get the church up and running, but they're pretty cautious about being open about it because it's not their high priority and quite rightly, they want to be about evangelising and calling people into the kingdom. So they don't want people to get confused about the fact that, that money's too important. And yet, there are a whole lot of reasons for uh, putting money on the agenda, uh, including the, the practical needs of the church. What, what we're doing these days is we're getting our, right from the outset when the core team is forming and praying about the ministry direction of a church, we're getting the topic of money on the agenda. And I'm encouraging our church planters to be clear about what they're doing personally, financially, when it comes to church planting, and putting that on the agenda squarely with their core team, and asking their core team to actually um, pledge very clearly what they're doing for the first one to three years of the church plan. Yeah. So, that, so that the core team own not only the ministry direction of what they're trying to do, but all the incidental implications of that, including finance. So you, would say, you, would, say pledge, you would say pledge for one to three years? Yeah. Uh, yep, okay. Yep, and the reason for that is because it, it helps people, it's not just a financial question, but it helps your core team know they've signed up for a period of time especially when the, the fun part is going to be the first six months and then the hard work part is probably the next two years after that. Yeah. Uh, you know, so they, there's a sense of signing up for ministry and signing up for you know, uh, the, finance, the finance commitment that's involved in that. And I think that's a really helpful thing to do. Uh, so, yeah. Okay. Um, by the way, to say to people involved in the webinar, if you'd like to send uh, questions in now, you can send questions to Ben, our host, and uh, they'll be passed on to Paul. Um, we're about to move into the second half of our time.
Paul, let me know, before we go to questions, um, one, one more thing. Uh, I think it was Peter Drucker, the business guru, who said culture beats strategy for breakfast. In terms of church life, you, uh, we've already talked about kind of the, the wider culture. Do you think that's right, culture beats strategy for breakfast? And how have you, how have you developed this culture of generosity? Do you have a, any particular tips for you know, younger guys, people in other churches? How do you develop a culture of, of generosity? Yeah, I look. I I think the culture of generosity is not just a, a generosity when it comes to money. It's a generosity that operates everywhere. So what you're trying to do with a church plant is to build a community of people that are generous with the gospel. Uh, so they're really keen to evangelise because they think it's so wonderful the grace grace of God in Christ that they want to share it with everybody. Uh, you want them to be uh, households and a church that's hospitable. So that's a you know when people come to their public meetings, they're really cared for and welcomed and yeah. um, treated really well. You want people to be opening up their homes and being generous in terms of the way they invite people in and care for them. You want the people in your church to be generously contributing in the wider community as they build relationships so that they've got a, a reputation for being people who are willing to get in and roll up their sleeves and give it a go. Uh, so that, that culture, I think, is one that you're trying to constantly see happen across the board. And, and one of the keys to that is the pastor being really generous uh, and, and modeling that in different ways in his life with the people that he shares life with. Then when it comes to money, um, it's a natural link. It's not natural in the sense that, that people will, uh, as you say, get very quiet and still when you talk about money. It's still you know, a sacred cow. But nonetheless, people will see the, 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 the lines that are drawn between who we are as a people and what it means for our money in a very clear sort of way. So I think I'm, I'm all for that idea of uh, seeing the culture of the church established and having an alignment with that culture and the question of finance. Yeah. Uh, how can you? You've got several thousand people in your church. Yep. How does Paul Harrington go about demonstrating generosity? You've only got 168 hours of the week, and uh, yeah. you're not Warren Buffett with money. Uh, how do you? How do you do that? Yeah, a number of different levels. So I think when I. Uh, when I preach, I try and communicate that. Uh, but so I want people to know that the gospel of God's grace and mercy is still real for me. So I keep remembering the generosity of God uh, and re you know reciting that as I preach. Uh, I keep trying to, when I preach, highlight generosity in others. So I try and find the the heroes that are doing evangelism or hospitality or serving, that sort of thing. Yes. Um, so part of it's me trying to set culture and communicate culture as I do that sort of thing. Then I work hard, particularly with my leadership and staff. Uh, we try and have people into our home and, and be you know, generous in terms of the way we have hospi hospitality there uh, with key leaders. So it's a, it's a trickle down sort of thing. Uh, and just just a willingness to be available when I can. Yeah, there, there's limited time, but you want to model it as is appropriate whatever level of you know ministry or service you've got. Yes, mm. I think if I could say without blowing wind up your skirt, you're a busy man. But what I've noticed is when I, I you you have time for people, and that is that if you're talking with someone, you're calm. It's not rushed. People appreciate the fact that they feel like they have time with you. I don't know how you do that, but, but you manage to do it. Yeah, <laughs> I think a question from Todd. Uh, when Paul was talking um, about the outside and speaking about money, do you take up a collection regularly during the service uh, or is it direct debit and uh, that kind of thing? So do you still pass the plate? Are you looking for cash giving or is it all over the web, you know, direct debit, that kind of thing? Yeah. Uh, one of our churches doesn't take any collection at all. Most of the others do. It, it's interesting, most of our income these days does come uh, by electronic means. So that's the primary way that people give. The main reason we still um, 
pass the plate around is not financial. So the main reason we pass it around is so we get um, feedback cards, comedy cards, new, newcomer cards on a Sunday, which possibly we could get at the door, but we think it's probably more effective for people just to pop them in a bag as it comes past for that reason. And that's the great emphasis when we pass the bag around uh, so, that, so that people can put that in. Some people still put, put money in, in the bag, but yep. it's, it's incidental almost financially to what we do. And we may change that. We may decide that it's, um, uh, we should be getting all our information from newcomers electronically. And if we got to that sort of point, we may well scrap passing bags around. So you keep thinking, not so much how do you get the most money, uh, but how do you build the most connections with people, I think, is what you're trying to do. Yeah, okay, okay. Uh, now, guys, I'm, I have to apologise. Um, I have to... Sorry, we just had a fire alarm here that I'm now told has actually stopped, so we don't have to... Okay. Sorry, I've got... I've got um, my boss here whispering in my ear saying, uh, fire alarm, evacuate the building. But uh, what's that smoke? I said, anyway, we'll, <laughs> we'll keep going. What could possibly go wrong? Um, one more question. We, um, with regard to... Um, yeah, sure. Uh, if you'd like to um, uh, ask Paul some questions, I'm sorry about that hiccup there, folks. But uh, anyway, if you'd like to ask Paul questions, you can email questions through to Ben and uh, I'll be able to ask uh, those of Paul. Uh, Paul, in this uh, slide that's come up, uh, the church planning survey we've done, it's um, uh, here we are, that 50 um, uh, churches, basically, if you're not a statistician, what it shows is those churches that are already uh, supporting other church plants are more likely to have the unchurched and visitors part of their regular meetings. Have you have you found that 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 an outward looking mission focus actually helps you with your own church growth? Yeah, I'm not sure if I I made the link directly between those two things. Uh, so what we found is that as we planted churches, we certainly had a higher percentage of unbelievers in the congregation. No question about that. Uh, yeah. Each of our churches, as I say, we, we build into the sense of them being a part of a network that's doing church planting. So this year we, we launched a new plant in March. All the churches in our network were praying for and keen to see that go ahead, wanted to know what was happening. Uh, each of our churches, we hope, will plant churches down the track. We've got two or three in our church planters in the wing. Uh, from existing churches wanting to plant in the next couple of years. So I, I think that culture certainly keeps outreach on the agenda. Uh, even in our mother church, uh, what, that's, that's planted a number of churches now. When we started planting, I think our evangelistic culture is probably not all that strong. And over the last 15 years, that's grown significantly. And I think on a, on a Sunday in our sort of mother church situation, uh, the one in the city, we, we probably do have you know, upwards of 10% of people who turn up who aren't believers. Uh, so that, that, that culture has grown and developed as we've been planting. So week by week, you've got 10, maybe 10% 10 of your people who are in church aren't, aren't yet believers. Yeah, I think in our, that's certainly, I couldn't tell you the stat for each of our churches, but that would be the stat in our uh, church in the CBD, you know, the, the mother church, the original church. So it's an old traditional church, but I think the culture of evangelism has been growing and the attendance of outsiders has been developing over time. Yeah, that's fantastic. Sometime, if the boss allows, I'd love to talk to you about preaching to two audiences, speaking to the believer and the unbeliever. <laughs> we don't need to yeah. rant about that. Uh, let me ask you a question. I have a question um, from, Pete Wood, uh, from Pete Wood uh, in New South Wales. Here's what Pete asks. Uh, Paul, what advice do you have for planters working in low income or welfare sorts of contexts? I guess public housing where people are um, doing it tough financially. How can we teach people with little money to be generous? Yeah, 
Yep. Okay. So I personally had no experience of leading a congregation in that context. So I should put it that way. We we have two of our churches that are in lower socio-economic areas uh, at this point in time. In fact, one of them has been planted in apparently the uh, the location in South Australia which has the lowest median income of any spot in the state. So uh, so we've we've been trying to work that one out a bit. I I think the principles are essentially the same. That is, people, if they're going to be generous in the area of money, whatever they with whatever they've got, whether they're a you know a widow with not much or uber wealthy, it's not going to happen except without discipleship. You know, one on one work in this area. Uh, we we need to keep preaching the Bible and teaching it up front and explaining what's going on. But in my experience today, people come into conversion from such diverse backgrounds that they need someone to sit down with them and one-on-one -on -one sit through uh, the issues in their life to understand how they fit with the biblical framework. It normally doesn't translate straight away from public preaching to a big congregation. I think that is especially true when it comes to money in Australia. Uh, I keep striking more and more people who have a whole series of presumptions uh, and seem to me to be formed uh, from anything except family background. Yep. Not, not so much Bible. Now it's not that they're not keen and don't love the Lord and aren't passionate about serving Him, but they just haven't worked out uh, the nature of discipleship in that particular area. So I take it whether you're in a wealthy congregation or a poor one, that's the work you've got to do in each of those spots. The, I think the particular challenge, especially in a more of a welfare context, is that you may have a, the work may take a few generations. Uh, I know someone who works in the APY lands, and they were saying that in their particular context, some of the issues that are ingrained in those communities may take several generations to work through. Uh, it's not going to be a, a five year changeover, it's probably going to be a 30 or a 40 year project. We've got missionaries in Cambodia who in the aftermath of Pol Pot, uh, they've been told that it might take 300 years for that country to completely recover. Uh, and that is just huge uh, in terms of the way in which yeah. those people have got to think about discipleship generational discipleship over a long period of time. Yeah. My guess is in a welfare context, you're faced with some of those sorts of ingrained issues that you've got to keep working at uh, over a long period of time. Uh, and what you've got to do is face the challenge of, if I've got a congregation of 100 in a really wealthy part of Sydney, and a congregation of 100 in a really poor part of Sydney, the chances are the income from the hundred in one spot to the other uh, will be dramatically different, but it's not their fault. <laughs> uh, do you know what I mean? You, that's just that's just the way it goes. So the pastor has to be patient and faithful uh, where they face more challenges or particular challenges in that area. Uh, the wealthy person will, you know, they'll face the the uh, camel through the eye of a needle problem, yeah. uh, and that's the pastor has a big challenge there breaking through the heart in that context. May not be the, the problem in a welfare context where people are more open to seeing their need. There'll be a financial implication though. So yes, yeah, it just comes to the territory. Mm. Yep. There's other issues too, like uh, I know parts of Sydney where the minister is the the, the lowest paid member of the congregation. Yeah. And there's parts of Sydney where the minister would be the highest paid member of the congregation. Living in the biggest house. Yeah. Right? Living in the biggest house. Yes, that's right. So what do you, yeah. you know, what do you do? How do you yeah. sort that out? Uh, now a question from Don. Paul, how do you approach hiring from a financial perspective? Uh, do you have a budget and then hire? Or do you need to see an upward trajectory before hiring? Uh, or set a vision, uh, have a need and go for it? Um, expecting the giving to lift. So do you, I guess I'd put it, do you need the bungee cord tied on before you jump or are you um, hoping it can be tied on 
sometime in the future. Yeah. Um, when when I became senior pastor at, at uh, Trinity, where I am now, we we had a system of meetings where we would have a finance meeting and a property meeting, and then a meeting of our elders where they received a finance and property report, and then they worked out what we were doing. Um, what happened was we we tended to hear all the property problems we had, all the money we didn't have, and then we'd make decisions on that basis. Uh, I, I don't think that was all that helpful, as it turned out, and so we scrapped the nexus between the two. So the, the principle we're working on is how do we plan for ministry to grow and gospel work to extend, and what resources will help us do that? So we're tending to plan for growing budgets on the whole, uh, and that's that's been our pattern over a number of years where we've had double digit growth budgets generally across our network. Uh, but then you get to a point where, for example, in South Australia, the economy is you know done a bit of a tank over the last couple of years, uh, particularly with the mining boom going going down, and we can't ignore that as well. Uh, so we need to be realistic about the way we plan for the future. So as I mentioned earlier, we've got a staff member coming on board next year. We hope there will be one. And we're asking people to pledge for that. That's because that's on the back of already an ambitious growth in budget. And therefore, we think there's no way we should do that uh, responsibly unless we get commitment to that. The other thing is, by getting that sort of pledged commitment, where we draw people into thinking through what we're doing and why we're doing it. So they're engaging in our ministry plan, and that, that actually helps them uh, in terms of owning what we are doing together as a community of God's people. Yeah, that's a, It's a bit of both. I, I think generally the, the task is to plan ambitiously and then to catch a cloth afterwards uh, as you go. Um, okay, so it does take... Um that takes some faith or courage uh, to step out that way. Yeah, yeah, I think it does. Um, but uh, you know, I think people respond to a gospel challenge. They normally don't respond to a financial one. Uh, yes, they do. They they love to see the gospel going out, and in a healthy congregation. Generally, our people, when they hear we're wanting to plant a church or we're wanting to do more evangelism or we're wanting to reach a group we haven't reached before, I guess, you know, I stand on the shoulders of people who've worked hard before me to establish that that gospel-hearted community and they generally respond. You know, they they will say, this is a good thing, let's give it a shot. You know, and I, and I think that God's people generally will do that in most spots. Yep. No, I reckon you'll get your banter in fast. Uh, question for Chris in Victoria. Um, yeah, this is about a very big issue. Uh, I'd like to hear experiences of whether to say renting property, working to raise capital for a building. Um, when do you know the best cost stewardship is to move from continuing renting, to getting a building, um, you know, a building which is greater gospel, which is greater gospel impact. Uh, wisdom on when to buy, when to rent, um, that, that issue, Paul? Yeah, sure. The, the churches we've planted here in Adelaide uh, are all meeting in rented facilities. So that's, that's been our current pattern. We haven't done that uh, because we think it's wrong to buy or to have a capital campaign, but it seemed to us that probably the most effective way we could get going and do the most evangelism to start with was to not tie up our money in real estate. So that was our policy as we got started. And I think it, whenever you stop for capital campaigns or you have to put a focus there, inevitably it will draw funding away from gospel initiatives. So you'll need to pause in terms of the way in which you expand. So that would be one thing I'd say. Um, however, uh, there are a number of reasons why, why you might think about buying a property. Uh, one of those would be if you've got a church that's established and growing, you may think it's helpful to get a, uh, a permanent property base 
as you grow and develop. You don't want to do it too early uh, because um, too often I think our buildings shape our ministry when we want our ministry to shape our buildings. And if you get that back to front, the investment in real estate becomes quite a distraction. And if you, for example, get a building that can hold 300 people, what do you do if you get to a point where you filled it up? You lose the flexibility to keep growing gospel work because you feel like you've arrived. Uh, we've had that experience in our mother church. So we basically filled up the site and then there was a the question of, well, what do we do? We're full. Uh, yeah. So we're planting churches. We're trying to push people out to create space. Uh, but the, the plants themselves now have flexibility to move around. The real issue right now is because of the culture in Australia, will we have the ability to keep renting community facilities into the future? And that's a, a wider uh, culture policy issue that is shaping up to be one which could cause problems for Christians, which means we may need to invest in real estate to preserve our capacity to keep meeting in public spaces. So uh, that may vary from spot to spot. The other thing I think is that uh, in uh, some locations, for example, if we were trying to establish a beachhead into the city of Adelaide now, uh, the real estate cost would be enormous. Uh, and I don't know that we could do it. but. Because of the way in which people planned in the past, we have a decent block of land in the middle of town which provides us with unique gospel outreach opportunities. So if I'm thankful for having that block of land, I probably should think about how I look after other people in the future that might have the same sorts of needs. Yeah, you know, so there, there's some there's some random thoughts anyway. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Don't, just don't build the building out of sandstone. Um, yeah, that's it. <laughs> uh, got a question, another question from uh, Todd. Uh, in thinking about generosity, do you find uh, people are more motivated when there's a big thing happening, like a ministry appointment or a building program? Uh, you always have to give people the vision to attach to generosity. Uh, will people like, if you like, keep on giving when it's business as usual, or do you have to come up with a big shiny object all the time? Yeah, it, I think it's a combination of both. You, people need to understand that the electricity costs money. Uh, so, you know, we do need to be clear. Uh, Communication is important. Uh, letting people know what stuff costs and how it's getting paid for on a regular basis is information that people appreciate. So transparency and openness about the content of your budget is useful. If you're um, thinking about where, where the gospel work is going though, you need to keep informing people about what's happening in the ministry uh, in terms of evangelism, how people are growing. And I suspect that it's just healthy for congregations to be thinking about the what next question. Mm. But you just need to recognize that your congregation is made up of different sorts of people. Right? Some are entrepreneurial and they're thinking are grabbed by the big idea. Some are scared and think it's overly ambitious and what do we need the, you know, why do we need to be doing these things? You know, uh, some are worried about the fact that we might be running in a deficit. You should never do anything unless you've covered your deficit already. And that speaks of people from a certain generation. So you need to work out how to grow and serve people with all sorts of different backgrounds as you press forward, even though you may have one overarching sense of vision or direction for where you're heading into which that fits you know so it's it, it's just being aware of your congregation i think and working with them in terms of how to get all of you on the same boat going the same direction mm. yeah okay okay uh question from joel uh how do you go about encouraging generosity um, in the congregation with other gospel partner ministries so yep. um uh, if you want people to invest in other, you know, mission organisations or, you know, some of the parachurch groups do a good job. Um, I guess, you know, just pick one at random, say Geneva Push. Um, <laughs> how do you go uh, encouraging your people to be generous? Are you asking people to keep the Trinity and then funnel it on? 
or do you say something else to congregations? Yeah, we what we try and do is build direct connection between those organisations and our people. Uh, so we don't try and funnel the money, and I think if we did that, we probably would restrict people's generosity. And most of the organisations that we partner with like to have more direct connection for the purpose of updating information and everything like that with our members. And so what we tend to do is with our Sunday meetings, we'll profile uh, several of our partners on a regular basis throughout the year. Uh, we'll hear about the gospel work they're doing, how, what needs they have financially and how to link together. So we do that with mission agencies. We do that with uh, local, like cross-cultural mission agencies. We do it with local mission groups. Uh, we do it with the local Bible college. And we just try and keep giving them airtime uh, in order to help people hear what's going on. We do it with our own sort of church planting ministry, so we get our people to keep thinking about how they can support the wider work of the gospel in Adelaide through church planting, which we're doing. Mm -hmm. um, that's the way in which we do it. So we don't hold the money as a church and require it to be sent to us. Uh, in, I think that would be a controlling thing to do, which wouldn't be helpful. Um, and what we're trying to do with those partner ministries is encourage our people to uh, be generously connecting with those ministries. So uh, me as a pastor, I'm not trying to fend off these organisations and keep them at bay. I'm trying to make sure they're enormously successful in what they're doing. And so I need to help my people get behind those so that they can be successful in gospel terms with the mandate that they have. And I want those organisations to know that they don't have to come begging to us. We think what they're doing is good, which means we want to proactively support them. Uh, so the culture, again, is one of generosity towards them. Yep. Okay. I think I've got time for one more quick question. Um, it, uh, often in congregations, you'll find 80% of the money is given by 20% of the people. Yep. Uh, do you know who your big givers are? And would you encourage your pastoral team to know who the big givers are in terms of people who make large contributions, that you're closer to them or you, um, you're aware of that? Do you manage big givers? That, uh, I think you know what I'm asking. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I get it. Um, I've, I've made it a policy over the years not to know who they are. Now, I can probably guess who they are, uh, but I've... I've deliberately chosen not to. I don't think it's wrong to know, but I think there's risks attached to it. So the risk for me is that I'll treat people differently based on what they're giving, and I don't want to do that. Uh, the risk for them is that they get treated differently because of how much they give. And I want them to be generous, uh, not pandered to or whatever. Now on the other side of things though, to know who your generous givers are, it can be appropriate for you then to be saying to them, you're no different, you've just got a lot of money and you ought to be using your money for good purposes and I've got a good purpose for you to give towards. Uh, so so that that's a good thing to do. I feel like for me, there's some risks attached to that. So I'm careful in guarding my own godliness when it comes to it. And also, as I said, trying to guard the godliness of the people who are wealthy too and just to uh, make sure we're looking after them. So that's the policy of, I've approached. But I don't think it's wrong to know, and I know other people who do that, and I think they handle that well. For me, I've just been a bit more careful. Okay, okay. Uh, I think I've got time for one more quick one. Um, uh, some pastors will get their treasurers or elders or church warden, whatever your particular denomination, to talk to the congregations about money. I've heard another pastor say, treasurers count the money, senior pastors have to raise the money. <laughs> Do you have a policy on, on, on that? Thoughts on that? Yeah, look, I, um, I think my general principle is that the, the pastors probably need to be very clear about where we're going as a church and why people need to be generous in giving towards it. So I think the pastor will set the vision in lots of ways. Uh, you want to guard against that though because you want the congregation to own 
the financial direction of the church. So having an us rather than an us them mentality means you will get other people talking about it or running events or giving information or providing updates that helps everyone. And that, so I think the big picture thing is probably going to be driven by the pastor. Uh, and then there are other ways in which your congregational members with treasury type roles or leadership roles can step into the space and encourage generosity as well. And even model it by saying what they do, you know, which I think can be really helpful. Yep. Okay. Well, Paul, let's, uh, we've come to the end of our time. Thank you for your time, mate, and uh, may God keep blessing the work of the Trinity Network in Adelaide. Very kind, Al. It's been great to catch up with you today. Okay, mate. Thank you for your wisdom. I'll hand back to Ben now. Thank you very, thank you very much, Al and Paul. Uh, guys, that was fantastic, talking about inspiring generosity uh, into and towards your church plant. I'll just turn off the videos of Paul and Al so they don't have to sit there and keep staring at us as we, as we finish this off. Gentlemen, thank you so much for that. Um, and another quick thanks to EA Insurance and Compassion as well, our sponsors for um, the, the Planet Session webinars here at Geneva Push. Speaking of uh, the Planet Session webinars, go to GenevaPush.com and check out the Planet Session's archive. We have an enormous archive full of resources of uh, past Planet Sessions. We've got videos, we've got blogs, we've got wisdom lists, all that kind of stuff. Speaking of Planet Sessions, the next one is coming up on July 6th at 9.30 a.m. We've got Mikey Lynch, one of Geneva Push's founding directors, speaking with UK pastor and evangelist Pete Woodcock about his experiences uh, pioneering new congregations from scratch and utilising the remnants of an older work to start something new. Now, during that discussion, we'll be hearing, from the relative, we'll be hearing about the relative advantage, advantages of each approach, the risks, the practical implications, and most importantly, Pete will help us understand what factors help us decide the best approach for reaching the region God has brought to our attention. So join Mikey and Pete on July the 6th at 9.30 a.m. To register, go straight to GenevaPush.com and register right now. Thank you so much for joining us, for inspiring generosity into and towards your church. A big thanks to Al and to particularly to Paul Harrington from Ho uh, Holy Trinity Network in Adelaide. I've been Ben McKechn. Join us again at the next planner session. Until then, see you later and go straight to GenevaPush.com to register now.